Well, hi everyone, and thank you, Kelsey. Um, I was actually in town for the opening, and I had a wonderful time. Unfortunately, I couldn't stay in town. I'm currently in Suwannee, Tennessee. My husband's teaching at a music festival here, um, so I'm actually coming from a dorm room <laughs> at University of the South. Um, and I just want to thank you all, you know, first of all for coming out. Kelsey told me it's raining there. It's raining here too. Um, so uh, I was a little concerned about uh, connection issues here. I don't have internet or, or actually cell phone reception um, outside of being at you know, our residence. So last night after my daughter went to bed, I, <laughs> my husband and I sat in one of the closets and recorded this, this little 10 minute video um, of me talking about my work. And I decided to do that in case we had any um, connection issues. So what I'd like to do is show all all of you that and then you know answer any questions or elaborate in on um, any of the work that you'd like to hear about further so um, if uh, Jonathan do you mind go ahead and starting that yes, thank you hi I'm Diane Hansen the persistent painter and I'm so excited to have my series of paintings titled fair on display at the Baton Rouge Gallery for contemporary art these paintings are inspired by baking competitions in county state and world fairs it may look like sweet little paintings of cupcakes and desserts, but the little vignettes raise questions of what is fair when it comes to the commodification of land, the use of our natural resources, and socioeconomic opportunities. There are a total of 18 paintings that I completed over the last two years. To explain how these paintings came to fruition, I would like to talk first about my studio practice. If you follow me on Instagram at the Persistent Painter or Facebook, you will notice I sometimes post still lives or landscapes in addition to the work I have on display at the gallery. They may not seem to relate, but they inform each other. I split my studio time between observational work, such as still life or landscape, and then I take what I've learned and apply that to my other work that I like to call reconstructing reality. These paintings are a place for me to think and ask questions and explore any idea or topic. The process is like having a conversation that evolves, or I also like to think of it like a puzzle that begins with a word or a phrase that develops into an image. I like to work in a series to explore an idea in depth. So how did I get to these fair paintings? Well, several years ago in 2013, I had a show titled Selective Memory which had this repeated figure I called Persistent Pollyanna. This figure was rearranging her world to her liking. I was reflecting on how we can shape our narrative and experience by what we choose to remember or what we focus on. In one of the paintings called Sugar Coated, there was a figure making cupcakes with little houses on top, a homemaker. I started to think of these cupcakes as plots of land which led to a series of paintings titled Sugar Coated that focused on agricultural practices. So my sugar addiction continued in this series of paintings. I was thinking about the Minnesota State Fair and how as a kid I felt it was a great place for rural and urban communities to come together. Growing up on a farm is so apparent that my day-to-day -day experience was very different from my friends that lived in the cities. And I have found this idea of rural versus urban resurface in my work throughout my career. I was also thinking about the idea of fairness and how points of view, experience, values, and our own personal needs shape our idea of what is fair. It could be a challenging topic, especially when there doesn't appear to be a clear answer. Also, I have a seven-year-old and I realized how this concept starts young. Even kids have a clear opinion on what they think is fair. Just ask any kid who thinks should get the bigger slice of cake. <laughs> so I began researching world fairs and state fairs, and I found the subject quite layered and fascinating. I was also thinking about my grandmother who made those jello desserts with fruit in them and a Betty Crocker competition she entered. I envision jello as sections of the ocean reflecting on how we use this vast resource and our impact on its inhabitants. And on a side note, I actually made jello 
with little plastic toys in them. I soon discovered I needed to add a lot more gelatin since my first attempt melted in the studio. There is also a little nod to Damien Hirst's preserved tiger shark in formaldehyde that he titled, The Physical Impossibility of Death in the Mind of Something Living. Initially, I wanted to create a large installation of three baking booths, grouping most of the paintings in three colors, two primary colors, yellow and blue, and the secondary color, green. I thought of these colors representing different elevations, such as blue for sea level and yellow for drier climates. Between each booth was going to be a monochromatic landscape with elements of fair rides or exhibits. I finished one of these, but made adjustments to my plans as the pandemic turned the world upside down and I decided to facilitate online schooling for my daughter. While I can't cover every idea and topic here, I thought I would point out a few paintings in this series, but please drop me a note at thepersistentpainter.com if you have any questions or thoughts you'd like to share. So this painting is titled Entangled, which has this string running through the image connecting different elements. It refers to the development of wind power and its impact on migratory birds. The airplane on the cupcake references how the Minnesota State Fair cattle barn building was repurposed during World War II for the A.O. Smith Corporation to manufacture military aircraft propellers. And a fun fact I found while exploring this subject is that in 1932 at the Iowa State Fair, Joe Connolly collided two locomotives. One was called the Roosevelt train and the other was named after the Iowan Herbert Hoover. It was a spectacular presidential election year showdown that helped make the Iowa State Fair a success. The socioeconomic roots underlying access to land ownership is explored in my painting titled Classy, where the bottom tier of the cupcake stand depicts the average US cost of a house in 2020 of $280,600 at various locations throughout the United States. The middle tier consists of US houses priced at 1 million and the top tier is made up of one large private estate. Home ownership is rooted in both employment opportunities and family support. Lacking either makes the process much more challenging. Climbing the ladder is not simply a matter of the trope of individual perseverance, but requires both opportunity and support. The painting 79 cents depicts the gender wage gap as represented by the divided birthday cake topped with gender targeted toys. The coronavirus pandemic has exacerbated the issue of childcare and the equitable division of family responsibilities. Like many parents, I found myself facilitating online school for my child. The birthday cake represents the challenge of parenthood as each year passes and raises questions about the division of parental responsibility, the balance of work and family, and the gender messages children receive. The painting Migration was created right before the pandemic and reflects the mass exodus of people from rural communities to urban areas in search of opportunities. As farms became larger in order to survive, many didn't last. Small town populations contracted and schools consolidated. I never imagined that only a year after the completion of this painting, that there would be so many people relocating out of major cities. This recent migration poses economic consequences, such as housing affordability and availability to these smaller communities. The impact of opportunity or lack thereof greatly affects communities as they swell or contract. In the six paintings titled 1950 to 2000, identical cake slices were painted on six panels with white background. Color was then added around the slices of cake. The interactions of the color in the individual panels make the slices appear varyingly brighter or duller. The land remains the same as the little vignettes changes over each decade. The average size of new houses has doubled from approximately 950 square feet in 1950 to 2,266 square feet in 2000. 
while the size of the average household has decreased. I hope this work inspires some curiosity, conversations, and creativity. If you have any thoughts you would like to share, please contact me on my website, thepersistentpainter.com, or on Instagram at The Persistent Painter. Thank you. Okay, so can you hear me? Hi, I'm okay. Beth Jansen, the persistent painter. Oh, well, it's me too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyways, well, yeah, we were putting that together last night. I was wanting to also put something that can continue to be used. So um, obviously you don't have to wait to send me a message. You can ask me now. I'm here. <laughs> Um, is there anyone that has any questions about the, the work I talked about or what you've seen? Hi, I do. I uh, just okay, wanted to please. let you know you're full screen. I'm full screen. Oh, fantastic. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, does anyone have it? There was a, another little painting I didn't talk about that was titled um, Test with the cupcakes with the atomic bomb going off. Um, that one was uh, referencing the uh, atomic tourism that happened in Nevada in the 1950s. And that was one I, I, I thought I, um, uh, I wanted to mention as well. I should also uh, point out that in my little talk, I just realized that um, the Jonathan, the, sorry, the uh, Damien Hurst piece is actually titled The Physical Impossibility of Death in the Mind of Someone Living, Not Something Living. So I just wanted to correct that too. But does anyone have any... Uh, um, any questions? Well, I have, I have one. I love your painting. Oh, but thank you. I, well, aside from that, and this whole new dimension that I never even thought about, um, was Edward Hopper an influence on your work or not at all? Um, I do. Um, you know, it's interesting. I don't. I wouldn't say it's a conscious um, influence, but obviously, I'm very well aware of his work, and I love how he. Um, uses light and constructs the surface and also the subject matter too, you know. Um, so I could definitely see some overlap there, but it's not something I was conscious of. Right, and, and then where do you get your little miniature figures that you use? Um, I actually paint the cakes and cupcakes typically from life, and then I use photographs as references and I just scale them down, you know, um, and and from my experience in painting from, from life, I. I find that I can adjust it enough to make it work with the, the lighting situation I have. So those are all invented. The little vignettes are just things I, I, I bring together a bunch of different uh, source materials to bring that, you know, that image together. Thank you. Oh, of course. Thank you. Yes. Um, I love your work also. And I hope oh, that thank you. when I was here, and I'd be really nice to talk to me a while about it. Um, I wanted to ask if, because earlier you said you kind of go about the week of painting whatever you see, you like to paint. And then you sort of look at all of those, and some idea um, comes to you, and then you sort of pull that work in to illustrate that idea. So I was wondering what were some of the other things that you had to make your paintings work around? Um, some other previous bodies of works? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Oh, for this one. Oh, for this theme. See, what I like to do is I, um, I keep a list of different words and phrases. And then when I'm, I take what, you know, I, I do my observational work, I read, I have conversations. And when I look at those words, like I do the, I love words that have multiple meanings depending on context. And fair was a just a great word that coming kept coming back to me, um, and that's kind of how it was like a springboard into this work. So I, I started just what I do when I have this idea. I start co um, collecting different books to read, different articles, and and it's funny. I'll start with one painting. The first one that I started with was Rising Tides, which is the one with the water pitcher. And living in Miami, Florida, I should say this is that even though I'm in Swanee, Ten Swanee, Tennessee now, I live in Miami. And of course, sea level rise was a topic um, that, you know, was on our minds there. And that's what brought that one first to life. And then my daughter's really interested in um, 
endangered species and invasive species in Miami's, which led to the next piece, invasive. So it's really the process of making the work is like having a conversation where I start an idea, and then you have to kind of go with it, you know, follow the thought, follow that, um, um, you know, just to where it leads to. And that's what I really like about these works. I really don't know in the end, I don't start a body of work under thinking about every single work. It kind of devolves as I work on it, which is why I find it, you know, I love working that way as opposed to a still life or landscape. I have a very, very clear idea of what my, my goals are when I accomplish that. Is that, is that answering your questions? I'm having a little hard time hearing, but I want to make sure I answered that. Yes. Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> so, is there any other question? Oh, I see a hand back there. I see a silhouette. <laughs> I love that it's palaces, but you may not want to eat it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, but, my daughter definitely wanted to eat the, the uh, <laughs> that. That's one of the things that draw, drew me to your work is that how it can be something that's enticing and repulsive at the same time. Mm -hmm. and oh, thank it's you. Also beautiful, and, and you make it beautiful. So uh, it's, it's, I think that's important. And I think you do that incredibly well. Thank you. Well, you know, one of the things I think about is I like paintings that open up over time, that you have an initial response to them. And then the more they look, you look at the piece, you discover stuff. Um, and I like that. And that happens with me as a painter, as I'm working on something, I do kind of discover the image and I love um, being able to um, pass that experience on to the viewer where you have one initial impression of it, but the more that you look at it, there's more layers to it. So that is something I'm consciously thinking about, you know, when I'm thinking about the perspective of the viewer, it's not, these paintings aren't meant to be didactic. They're meant to kind of ask questions and, and hopefully continue thought beyond just, you know, my one image, so. Well, very thought-provoking period, so welcome. Okay, right. thank you. Thank you very much. So. Anybody else have any questions or comments for Diane? All right, I think then we're going to move on to Marcus. Diane, thank you so much for taking the time to to zoom in with us, we appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. So, all right, bye. And enjoy the rest of the talk and congratulations also to Marcus and Anne. Their, their work is wonderful. So you guys are in for a treat to, to hear them talk about their work as well. So anyways, have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. bye.